Um, I'd like to um, continue what I started on this morning with um, the basis for all of this, the basis for um, doing the best that we can to, to cultivate uh, an environment and a tone uh, and uh, a, a listening posture uh, to the end that, that we can actually come to the point where we can love across the lines of, of difference and disagreement, uh, to come to the point where we can uh, hold simultaneously to uh, the convictions that we have and the beliefs that we have that are formed uh, by the scriptures, uh, and, and, and not in spite of, but because of those convictions, uh, love well. And, and uh, the love chapter is... is uh, Something I'd like to read before I get into uh, sort of these last few moments of, of, of sharing, uh, and it's in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. It's a very familiar passage, uh, and uh, you might be surprised to know that it's one of the sharpest rebukes in the whole of Scripture, because it's everything that the Corinthians were not. And so these are the words of the Apostle Paul to the church in Corinth, and he says, if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong, or a clanging cymbal, and if I have prophetic powers, and understand all mysteries, and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all that I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. It does not envy or boast. It's not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It's not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. And as for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child, but when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I'm fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these gifts is love. And so there was... Um, there's a fascinating talk that, that uh, David Brooks, uh, who's a columnist with the New York Times, gave within the last year, and he, he also uh, released a, a book recently on, on, on virtue, and uh, this talk was, was essentially a summary of this book, and, and it was one of the most fascinating talks that I've heard in, in a long time, because uh, you know, what he did was he distinguished between two sets of virtues that... Um, that we all wrestle with and, and live uh, in the tension of. And, and uh, you know, Brooks started his talk by highlighting the fact that we are all on, on some level uh, achievement-oriented. And, 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 uh, and the two sets of virtues that he says that we're living in, uh, or, or living with in, in light of an achievement environment, an achievement impulse, an achievement culture, uh, is what he calls the resume virtues, uh, and the resume virtues are the ones uh, where we, we, you know, we employ these virtues in order to improve ourselves, to make ourselves more marketable, uh, to open doors, uh, to gain upward mobility, to make a name for ourselves, and so on. So that's what he calls the resume virtues. And then, and then there's the eulogy virtues, and the eulogy virtues are the things that we want people to say to us at our funerals. And, and those things are very similar to the list of love attributes that was just read a moment ago, or to the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These are the things, nobody's going to care if we, if we um, you know, earn, mil you know, you know earn, earn millions and, and, and got huge bonuses and, and, and were, were successful at whatever we did if we didn't you know, also carry these virtues, and, and, and if, we, if the people that were closest to us can't describe us in the way that the Scripture describes love. And so that's, that's essentially where Brooks lands in his talk, as he says, we all know instinctively that the eulogy virtues are the most important ones, and yet 
we live as contradictions to ourselves because we tend to build our lives on the resume virtues. And so when the Apostle Paul writes to first century Corinth, he's writing to an entire community of people who are masters at the resume virtues and they're completely failing at the eulogy virtues. They're failing at love. They're divisive. Uh, they're hostile. Uh, uh, they're, they're, you know, they have broken ethics, uh, broken morality, and broken relationships, and, and all of the rest. And so, um, so just to close things out, at least as far as my part is concerned uh, today, is I just want to talk about a couple of things. What is love, and how do we get it inside of us? Um, so what is love, uh, except that it is, as, as Paul has said to us, the absolute most essential gift that God has given to the human race. Without it, he says, nothing else matters. Without love, we, we, we have nothing and we gain nothing. And, and, and then he starts to talk about, um, you know, different, different things that the, the Corinthians in particular, and I think these things are universal for all, you know, all, all types of people, uh, that the, the Corinthian people were, were uh, seeking an identity from. They were, instead of seeking an identity from the love of Christ, they were seeking an identity from their skill sets and from their ethics. Okay, and, and so, so the skill sets were, um, you know, similar to, to what Brooks referred to as the resume virtues. Um, you know, if you look, you know, throughout this whole passage, he describes them in, in, in several different ways, but, but it's very clear that they're smart, that they're talented, they're gifted, they're, they're, having, they're having impact, there, there are people on the move. Uh, the world is looking at them because of their various successes, and, and, and these things are all referred to as, okay, these are nice things, but they're not ultimate things. They're, they're not the things that you're going to want said about you at your funeral. You see, because the people in, in Corinth, they were this sort of walking contradiction. They had all of these skills and all of these gifts, even spiritual gifts, but they used even those spiritual gifts given to them by God as an opportunity to, to, to leverage against others and, and, and to, to behave in loveless ways instead of loving ways. You know, he talks about how some of them spoke in tongues and prophesied, had the ability to fathom mysteries, faith to move mountains. So these are poetic people, they're prophetic people, they're intelligent, they're discerning, they have gifts to teach, they're passionate, they're sound in, in, in their doctrine, they're stacked with leaders and visionaries. And, 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 and what Paul is saying to them is your success, this, the, all of this, these things that you're, you know, you're looking to, 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 to give you your identity, the things that you're being successful in, in the eyes of the world around you, you have to understand, he's saying, it's as if he's saying to them, that, that, that your success is merely cosmetic. It's not real. Because you're lacking the one thing that makes people successful. In a, in a sense, this is, a, this is an earlier comparison to a later church that, that, that Jesus speaks to directly in Revelation. It's, it's the church at Laodicea. And, and if you're familiar with that letter, Jesus says to them, I know you, and I know you have a reputation for being alive. He doesn't say, I know you are alive. He says, I know you have a reputation for being alive. But here's the true verdict. Here is the, the true assessment of things, Jesus says to them. You are naked and poor and wretched and blind, and I'm nauseated over it. And, 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 and the reason is that, 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 that again, that, that, that the people in Laodicea, just like the people in Corinth, are looking to their skill sets to, to, to establish them as being important. And, and so, you know, being in the environment that I'm in, uh, I have a lot of these types of people in the community that I pastor, and um, knowing that that makes me vulnerable to this mindset, I, ever since I, I've gotten there, and, and really before that, when, when I was in New York City for five years and, and surrounded by people who, uh, you can't stay in New York City for more than a month unless you've been successful at what you've done. And, and, and so I started praying a prayer that, that I hope you'll pray for me if you, if you remember me uh, after, after this, and that is that, that, that my character would always be bigger than my gifts and, and that my humility would always be bigger than whatever platform or whatever influence 
that, that God decides to, to entrust to me for whatever season of time. Character bigger than gifts, humility bigger than platform, because if you reverse those things, you're in big trouble. And those things were reversed in Corinth. They lacked the character but had the gifts. They lacked the humility but had the platform. And, and, and God says to them, you've got nothing. And, and so, so that's the first thought. But then the second is that, 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 that some of them were looking to their ethics, to their morality, which I think is more germane to the conversations we've been having today. And, 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 and they, were, they were looking at themselves as, as, as a people of worth, as, as a people of value because of, of either their progressive ethics on the one hand or their conservative ethics on the other. There were some in their, com, in their community who, who, um, who had more you know, sort of progressive or liberal ethics as we would categorize them because there were many who uh, were willing to give all that they had to the poor, it said. They were very, very generous people to, to, to those in need. There were plenty of those in the Corinthian community. And then there were the, those on the, the conservative side of things uh, 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 who would deliver their bodies up to be burned before they would renounce their faith, before they would renounce their beliefs. They, they would rather die than renounce their beliefs. And so, so that's more or less a conservative virtue. And, 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 and Paul says to them, even if these things are true about you, even if you're giving all that you have to the poor, and if, 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 if you're so committed to your faith that, 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 you would, that nothing could, 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 could tempt you to renounce your faith, if you do not live that faith out in, 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 in a context of love as it's described here, patient and kind and so on, and forbearing, then you, you are nothing and you have nothing. I mean, a, a chilling example of this is Judas. Judas is one of the, the 12 disciples of Jesus, right? And if you know the story of Judas, all the way to the end, you know that Judas was the treasurer. He kept the money. You know that he, like all of the others, prayed for people and healed them of their diseases in Jesus' name. He spoke on, the, on behalf of the poor, Judas did. He was sound in his beliefs about the scriptures. He had sound doctrine and sound theology. In fact, Judas was so indistinguishable from the other disciples that at the Last Supper, when Jesus said to his closest followers, his closest friends, one of you is going to betray me, nobody automatically thought it was Judas. They all started asking, Lord, is it me? And that's really a sign of true discipleship, is, is you're one of the most humble people in the room, that, 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 that you, you, you might be the most virtuous, but you don't see yourself that way because you understand that there's, there's still this great gap between, between the grandeur and holiness and love of God and, and, and where, wherever we are at the moment, that we still have so much longer to go. Everybody was saying, is it me, Lord? But nobody suspected Judas because, because on the outside, people's lives were changing through Judas's ministry. But Judas himself wasn't changing. And so this is the warning sign for Paul. The love that you profess for God, if it is not translating into a love for your neighbor. And if you're, and if you're failing at loving for your neighbor, and your neighbor points that out to you, and, 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 and you don't respond to, to that failure at love with, with humility and, and teach me and help me love you better then that's a significant warning sign that there is a dissonance, a, dis, a distancing between what you say is your love for God and, and your love for people because the, 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 the first and second greatest commandments, love God, love, love neighbor, they're, they're inseparable. You can't love God and not love your neighbor any more than you can truly love your neighbor and not love God. They, they, they go together. And, and what's happening in the Corinthian church, if you go through this, this letter, it's, it's sort of terrifying and, and and, you know, I, I sort of chuckle on the inside when, when, when people say, I'm just so tired of the church and I'm leaving the church because there are no New Testament churches anymore. And, and this is the most vivid example that we, we get of a New Testament church. We have this ideal of this beautiful, wonderfully non-offensive, loving community that never does anything wrong and it's loving its neighbors so well and, and they're just getting along in perfect harmony. And, and, and yet here is the New Testament church that has more written to it and about it than any other church in the Bible, and it's Corinth. And, 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 and instead of giving up on them and instead of dismissing them and instead of showing them the door and, and, and shaking the dust off of his feet and saying, I'm going to another town and I'm done with you, Paul starts the letter 
referring to them as beloved, as sisters and brothers, as, as, as saints, the holy ones, set apart by God. Not as his choice people, because there's no such thing as a choice person, but as, their cho- as his chosen people. He starts with benediction. He starts with blessing, and then he lets them have it for the rest of the letter. He says, here's your identity. You're beloved. Now I'm going to let you have it because you're not living like the beloved. Chapters 1 and 12, they're judging each other. Chapter 3, they're having major divisions over minor theological issues. Chapter 5, not just adultery, but serious adultery. It, not as if there weren't serious adultery, but, 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 but there is a man who is actually going to bed with his stepmother, and, and the community is just laughing about it. Isn't that funny? And he says, this is, this is tragic. You know, chapter 6, they have frivolous lawsuits against each other. Chapter 7, um, you know, marriages splitting up instead of reconciling. Chapter 8, parading their Christian liberty, many of them, in front of those who have a troubled conscience. Chapter 11, which is just a true tragedy, the rich are ignoring the poor and neglecting the needs of the poor that are right under their nose. So these attributes of love that are listed in, in, in Paul's love chapter that's read at weddings. Uh, <laughs> look, it was read at my wedding. So that, but, but, but the wedding application is actually a secondary use of this. The, the primary use of this was to rebuke people for not being what God had called them out to be and what God had equipped them to be. This list of love virtues, of, of, of eulogy virtues, is everything that the Corinthians at this time were not because as people of the narrow path of Jesus by virtue of being on the narrow path of Jesus with Jesus you will have the widest embrace you will not just be the best kind of friend you will also be the best kind of enemy you will respond to criticism you will respond to even hostility and to persecution Jesus says by praying for those who are hostile towards you, by, by, by extending love toward those who are even hostile towards you. Because that's, what, that's where you were when, when Christ came to you. He laid down his life for his enemies so that he could then say, I've laid down my life for my friends. And the more conservative we are in our beliefs about Jesus, in other words, the, 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 the more uh, we, we receive purely and truly what the scriptures say about him, the more liberal, the more progressive we're going to be in our loving. Because that's who Christ was. So there's the woman caught in adultery. John chapter 8. You know, but back to the subject of sexual ethics, right? Um, here's one thing that, 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 I, that I wish I would have said on the panel that, that, that I didn't, but I will say now. Never once does Jesus scold somebody for their sexual ethics. Instead, he comes to them with, with, with tenderness. And, 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 and the woman in John chapter 8, who is actually caught in the act of adultery, is no exception to that. And, and what he says to her after everybody leaves, and he, it's just her and God, eye to eye. Can you imagine having God looking you in the eyes after you've been exposed in this way? And the first words out of his mouth are a question. Has no one condemned you? And then the second set of words out of his mouth are a judgment. And the judgment is not the judgment that you expected. Because the judgment is, I do not condemn you. Now, go leave your life of sin. You take those two sentences, I do not condemn you, now go leave your life of sin. You reverse the order of those sentences and you lose Christianity and you lose Jesus. Because religion says, Leave your life of sin, and then maybe you won't be condemned. But the gospel says, I don't condemn you, and that's the environment you're in. That's your starting point. You are not condemned. Now let's talk about your ethics. Because it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. It is not our repentance that leads God to be kind. And, and, and so this is the, the generous disposition of Jesus toward us. And, and, and so, so that means that we are morally bound to start with the person in front of us with no condemnation. I do not condemn you. I don't have any right to condemn you because I'm not your judge in the first place. 
But that's where it's got to start. And then we can get into conversations about ethics at the right time. But, but first, the establishment of relationship is essential. So, so there was a man, um, I'll call him Mark, because that was his name. And this was early on in the planting of, of a new church, uh, where I was the, the, the planting pastor, much, much like um, you know, Rob has planted uh, Holy Trinity uh, here. It, it was just us and a few people at the beginning. And uh, we were having a prayer meeting. And into the prayer meeting walks a couple of people, a, man, a husband and a wife that, I, that I'd never met before. And it was very clear from the first moment that, that the man was very drunk and that his wife was very, very discouraged. And uh, I, I don't know why they, 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 they had that. I don't know what gave them the courage, especially her, to show up uh, that evening, but they did. And I'm so glad that they did because it's become one of the most um, redemptive stories of my experience. So we start to pray, right? Because that's what you do at a prayer meeting. And, and, and Mark decides that he's going to contribute to the prayer. And, 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 and he prays for about 15 minutes solid, straight. 15 minutes solid. And he's praying things like, um, you know, Robert mentioned that, that you all are familiar with Star Trek, right? More so with Star Wars, but, but you'll get the Star Trek references. He was starting to pray things like, Lord, protect us, please, from the Klingons, because I fear that a Klingon attack is coming. And, and, and Lord, um, Lord, would you please rain down Jolly Ranchers from heaven? Jolly Ranchers are the candy, right? Will you rain down candy from heaven? Because I really want a Jolly Rancher right now. Like, silly prayers. This is like a 38-year-old man, and he's completely drunk. And when you're completely drunk, many times you're completely honest. I'm scared about Klingons, and I want some candy. And and so, so we're about to close the prayer out, and I, you know, I'm peeking with one eye just, just to see what people are doing, and, and I notice they're all peeking straight at me with one eye, uh, because they're wondering, you know, what is the minister going to do after, after this is over with? And, and, and the beautiful thing was, I didn't have to do anything, because immediately after the prayer was over, uh, a, 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 a woman who had this disposition of, I do not condemn you, and that's our starting point, walked up to Mark and said, I'm so sorry. We're out of Jolly Ranchers. He said, but, but we have a lot of cookies. Do you like cookies? And he said, well, hell yeah, I like cookies. <laughs> and, and he ate about a dozen cookies and, 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 and you know, just sat there and had some incoherent conversation. But, but, but it was sort of the first step of Jesus Christ through the embodiment of people that your starting point here is, no, you're not the drunk man. You're, you're an image bearer of the Most High God. You, you're a person, you're not a thing. Crowned with glory and honor. Shattered, yes, but redeemable, absolutely. And, 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 and so, so there were about four or five others who, who went directly to his wife and said, how can we help? And the, the short story is that he ended up, you know, through the influence of the people in that very room, he ended up in a rehabilitation facility about eight states away, a long flight away, uh, and, 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 and while he was being re rehabilitated, people from that group would fly out and visit him. And, and, and it, you, you were just watching this man loved to sobriety and loved to life and loved to, to beautiful ethics. Not just with his addiction, but with his marriage and with his, his, his fathering and with his friendships and, and how he did his work. It was all being redeemed right in front of us. And, and, and this man, you know, who, who walked into a prayer meeting drunk, and that was the first time we ever met him, ended up becoming the best elder that I've ever had serve alongside me, even to this day. Because when you've been in, in the pit, um, you, there's this sort of compassion that develops that enables you to, to empathize with people who, who come in messy. Kindness leads to repentance. Repentance does not lead God to be kind. God has start with, do not condemn you. So, so how does love get into, this, how, into us? How do we become these kinds of people and, and live as these kinds of communities? And I think first, it, it starts with the recognition that love is not for the faint of heart. It's not a sappy, sentimental thing. You know, Webster's Dictionary uh, and, and, and really most modern definitions of love, most, most cultural definitions of love 
uh, really do align with Webster, where Webster says that love is a feeling of warm personal attachment or deep affection. And while, while feelings and affections are, are a wonderful byproduct of love, they're not the essence of it. There's Shaka Khan uh, sang a song called I Feel For You. On the basis of that, I think I love you. And you know, Tina Turner uh, referred to love as a secondhand emotion and a sweet old-fashioned notion. But I think Pat Benatar got it right. Anybody familiar with Pat, Pat Benatar? Love is a battlefield. <laughs> that is thoroughly biblical. And I, I don't know if she was writing her lyric as she was having a, a devotional in the scriptures. But, but, but that's really what the essence of love is. Love is a battlefield. It, you know, words like you know, tenacious and resilient and gutsy and selfless and graceful come to mind when we're talking about love because this word love is the word agape, which is the same word that Jesus uses when he says, I want you as my followers to love your enemies. Agape your enemies. Be patient and kind and forbearing toward those who detest you. Respond to hostility with gentleness, with gentleness. You know, this kind of love, agape love, is counterculture, and we see it played out when, when heated political discussions happen in our societies, right? We see it played out how countercultural agape is, that it's actually willing to, and, and eager even, with the energy of the Holy Spirit to, to reach across the lines of difference, even when we don't feel warm affection. Do you think Jesus felt warm affection on the cross? As he was bleeding out, being forsaken by the Father so that we would never be forsaken by the Father? Do you think that he was feeling warm fuzzies? He was saying, no, Father, if, if this moment can pass, please let it pass. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. That, that's the essence of love, that while we were still hostile toward him, Romans 5, 8 says, while we were still sinners, caught in the act, that's when Christ reached out and died for us. See, love in the agape sense is, is cruciform. Rich Stearns, who is the president of, of an organization called World Vision, uh, just does incredible humanitarian work and incredible um, you know, justice work across the globe, uh, in responding to the Syrian refugee crisis, said this. I, I had the privilege of, of, of being at a dinner uh, with him with, with about 10 or so other faith leaders. And he said this, I, I want you to imagine what it would do for the witness of the gospel if, if, if Christians were feeding Syrian Muslims while ISIS was beheading Christians. How do we become new people that respond in love, who, who, who love their enemies better than their enemies love each other? This is what turned the Roman Empire around. Are you familiar with that story of Emperor Julian who wrote the letter to his friend about the Christians? You know, Julian was, was to Christians as Hitler was to the Jews in Germany. He wanted to exterminate them because he saw them as a movement that, that, that could be a threat to his sovereignty. And they just kept growing and growing and their influence kept growing and growing and his kept shrinking and shrinking. And he writes a frustrated letter to a friend of his and he says that the secret of these Christians and their growth and their influence, their secret is this. They take better care of our poor than we do. What would it look like if that's what Christianity became known for again, reaching across the lines of difference, giving a cookie to a drunk instead of a lecture. You know, how do we realize this? We, we, we realize this when we realize that this is the environment that we're already in because when we were the persecutors, when we were the hostile ones, that's when Jesus came and loved us. Not when we were at our best, but when we were at our worst. And it comes from the recognition that, 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 that if, we, if, if we are people who attend worship, of recognizing that every single week we walk into his prayer meeting drunk. Maybe we're not drunk on a substance, but we're drunk on something else, our ambition 
We're drunk on our greed. We're drunk on our grudges and our resentment. We're drunk on our pornographic imaginations. We're drunk on our self-righteousness. We're drunk on what Tim Kreider called outrage pornography. It's all the same. It's all the same. We, we, we comfort Whatever we comfort ourselves with outside of Christ, you know, we, we walk in to his prayer meetings under the influence of those things. And so the first step toward loving is, is to recognize that in spite of, of whatever it is that, 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 that we are under the influence of outside of him, he starts by coming to us and saying, not here's a cookie, but here's some bread and here's a cup. You bring your history. I bring the bread and wine. And that's the deal. And that's how it works. Come to the table. It's a table of grace where, where the truth of the matter is all you need to qualify for this table is nothing. All you need is your need and a recognition of it. So I, I think that the closing thought would be to, to, to if we want to become the, the eulogy virtue people that David Brooks talks about, who can even surprise those who vehemently disagree with us on whatever. We have to focus our energy on the fact that this list of love virtues is more than a list of virtues. It's, it's a description of a person. It's a description of Jesus. It's a description of his attributes. And so theologians talk about how there are two kinds of attributes of God. There are the incommunicable attributes. Those are the ones that, that don't pass on to us, like his omniscience. He knows everything. His omnipotence. He's all-powerful. He can do anything he wants. His omnipresence. He's everywhere all the time. These things are not true of us and cannot be true of us because we're finite creatures, limited by space and time and so on. But then there are the communicable attributes, which are listed here in in this love chapter of, of patience and kindness and forbearance and a forgiving disposition and all the things that, that, that it's referred to. How, how else do we hear the word communicable? We hear it used alongside the word virus. What's a communicable virus? It's a virus that you can catch from somebody else. How do you catch a communicable virus? By proximity, by being close, by, by eating after, and by inhaling somebody else's breath. By intimacy, in other words. Intimacy is how we catch a virus. And in, 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 in the very same way, this is how we catch the qualities, the attributes of Jesus. We catch them through proximity, by being close in very ordinary ways. You know, eating his bread, drinking his cup, inhaling his breath, which, which is, you know, the voice of the Spirit of God that's given us in the Scriptures and in the sound preaching of the Scriptures and through the community of the redeemed. And so the takeaway is, if we want to love like Jesus, we have to first and foremost stop exerting our effort to love like Jesus and instead exert our effort to be with Jesus. And then the love rubs off as a byproduct that's communicated to us. So one of my, my I don't know how many weddings I've officiated over the years, but, but my favorite toast of all time was a toast that was given to the groom by the best man who was also the best man's brother. And they they had fought each other pretty much all of their upbringing. And, and, and his toast was very short and very powerful. And it was this. He takes the microphone and he looks at his brother and he says, I like you a lot more since you started spending time with her. How wonderful would that be said of us? That the world likes us a lot more because, and as they said in the scriptures as well, they're taking note that we've been with Jesus. So let's start there. What does it look like in our context to be with Jesus and to be around other people who are with Jesus that they might rub off on us and we might just see those communicable attributes, those, those eulogy virtues start taking us by surprise. Oh my goodness, I'm a little bit more patient than I was last year. Oh my goodness, I'm a little bit more generous and kind than I was last month because this community and this truth and this Jesus is rubbing off on me. Um, so that will be my prayer for you, and I hope that it will be your, your prayer for me, because I have a long way to go. I have a really, really long way to go. So thank you for having me. It's a real privilege to be here.